Hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I'm a Staten Island historian and author, and I'm pleased to be here at the Noble Maritime Collection today to talk about the history of the Staten Island Ferry. Now, most people don't realize it, but that the history of the Staten Island Ferry can actually be traced back to the original settlers on Staten Island. And they were, of course, the Lenape Indians. The Lenape had uh, what we can call landings all around the island. And they would take people in their canoes uh, from various locations, including right down here, not too far from the Noble Collection, uh, from Bard Avenue and Richmond Terrace. There was a known Lenape ferry landing there. Uh, there were other ones. There was one at what we now call Fort Wadsworth. There was one at what we now call Howland Hook. Um, and, you know, they would transport people back and forth in their canoes um, as people needed to be transported. Now, uh, when the first European settlers came to Staten Island, uh, they had the same situation. It was an island. They needed to ferry people back and forth. And what they did was they took up uh, many of the landings that the Lenape had already established, and they began to uh, have ferries going back from these already established locations. Um, in the 1700s, you needed a license from the government to have a ferry. You couldn't just put your ferry boat in the water. We say ferry boat, but they were really um, using what, what we now call and what they called at that time, periaguas. Periaguas were actually two canoes, two like uh, Native American canoes, tethered together. And when the French saw them, it reminded them of the word periagua. So that's the name that they took on. So most of the people who were operating ferries in the 1700s were using this type of a vessel. They were not very steady. In fact, um, some people were leery of putting themselves or their livestock or their produce in to these periaguas because oftentimes they would tip over. Uh, sometimes the periaguas would have masts attached. This way the wind could, could move the periagua along. Very often the men who owned them would paddle, use scoop-like paddles, much like the Native Americans used to use. Even there were other instances where they pulled the boats around where the water was obviously not very deep. So it was, uh, you needed a lot of strength once the wind died down and the, your sails were no longer necessary. Um, there were also instances later on where boats uh, used to ferry people uh, used horses. They would have a, a treadle connected to a side wheel of the boat, and they would actually have a man whipping the horse in order to make the horse move to move the treadle on the boat. Now, during the 1700s on Staten Island, we see ferries operating from the Narrows at Tottenville. As a matter of fact, the Tottenville Ferry was named after the Billop family, so it was called Billop's Ferry. And we see that quite a lot. We see ferries named after the people who operated them. For instance, the ferry that operated from what we call, would eventually call Stapleton, previous to that was operated by a man by the name of Abraham Van Duzer. So instead of calling it the Stapleton Ferry, they call it the Van Duzer Ferry. Same thing with Port Richmond. They wouldn't call it the Port Richmond Ferry. They would name it after the man who had the ferry you know, operation. So it was called at times Decker's Ferry or Mercero's Ferry because they operated the ferries at that location. Um, the watering place was another location where there was an important ferry. If you know today where um, the end of Victory Boulevard is, let's say, right by Lyons Pool, by Bay Street Landing, that is where the watering place ferry was located. Later on, it would be called the Quarantine Ferry. Now, this is a very interesting location because by the time we see steam uh, ferries operating in the early 1800s, a man on Staten Island who was very well known, Daniel D. Tompkins, a vice president, a governor of New York State, and an entrepreneur on Staten Island, who even 
started the village we now call Tompkinsville, he was actually the first person to operate a steamboat ferry. So prior to that, we had all these periaguas and horse-moving uh, horse boats, so to speak. But finally, in, in 1817, we see a steam-powered boat coming in at what was called the quarantine station. Now, now, now we would actually call it St. George. But after it was the quarantine station, it was Tompkinsville. Tompkins had, Tompkins had set up this community, so the ferry was named after him. Now, uh, the boat's name itself was the Nautilus. It only cost 25 cents to go either way on the Nautilus. And where did the Nautilus go? Well, it went to Manhattan. It went to Whitehall. Now, um, one thing that Tompkins also did was that he set up a toll road to meet his incoming ferry at the end of what we now call Victory Boulevard. Victory Boulevard, when Tompkins developed it, was actually called the Richmond Turnpike. And it was a toll road, toll. Imagine having to pay a toll driving down Victory Boulevard today. It's ridiculous. Well, back in the 18... 17, 18, 18, 18, 20s, you had to pay a couple of tolls to move along the Richmond Turnpike. Today is Victory Boulevard. Now, this was all part of a larger plan that Tompkins had in mind. This route would actually start in Albany. People would come down what we now call uh, Route 9. They would come down, they would go into Manhattan, they would grab Tompkins' boat, his ferry boat that was in Manhattan, take the boat over to Staten Island, land at the quarantine, get a stagecoach that went along the Richmond Turnpike, and it usually went to either what we now call Travis or out to Rossville, which at that time was called Blazing Star. At Blazing Star, they'd get another ferry that would take them to New Jersey. In New Jersey, they got another stagecoach that would take them to Trenton. At Trenton, they would get another boat that would take them to Philadelphia. And if you so desired, you could go on to Washington, D.C. So this was, the picture at Staten Island was part of a larger East Coast route that actually ran from Albany to Washington, D.C. Pretty wild when you stop and you think about it. Now, I just want to clear something up. Many people think that um, Cornelius Vanderbilt started ferry service to and from Staten Island, steamboat ferry service. But that's not true. He did become involved in steamboat ferry service on Staten Island eventually, but it was Tompkins who started steamboat ferry service. Before um, he got involved in um, steamboat ferries, Vanderbilt actually had a periagua that he would use to transport people from what we now call Stapleton over to Brooklyn, over to Manhattan. And he uh, became especially popular, him and his line, around the War of 1812 when he won a contract to transport goods to all of the forts in the New York Harbor. <coughs> excuse me, Castle Clinton, uh, uh, Governor's Island Fort, uh, Fort Hamilton over in Brooklyn, Fort Lafayette on the little island off Brooklyn. So that's really how he got a start with a periagua delivering goods. But back to steamboat ferry service. Now, in 1860, something really big happens on Staten Island. We actually see railroad service established for the first time. And this railroad actually runs from what we now call Clinton all the way to Eltingville. Eventually, it would make its way to Tottenville. But actually, this line went belly up <laughs> before it was even a year old. But it was the Vanderbilts, William H. and Cornelius, who actually bailed out this railroad line. And they reestablished it, and they took all of their business know-how, and they put it towards this Staten Island Railroad, and they made it a great success. 
So this railroad actually ran, as I said before, from Clifton, which was then called Vanderbilt's Landing, because by 1860, the Vanderbilts are heavy into ferries from Staten Island, and the railroad ran to Tompkinsville. Um, it was a very, very popular line. Um, but before I go any further, because we're in the 1860s right now, 1861, as you all know, a big event happened in the United States. War was declared between the states in April of that year. And the Union and the United States government, the Northern government, realized that, well, my goodness, these Staten Island ferries that they have running from Staten Island to Manhattan, they are just perfect for uh, transporting soldiers, transporting goods, putting big guns on their decks, because much like the ferries even today, they had very shallow bottoms. So they could go into the swampy areas of the South and they could drop off soldiers, pick up wounded, to take care of the wounded inside the ferry boats. They removed all the seating and they would bring the wounded soldiers there. And very often too, these Staten Island ferries participated in battles. And this was between 1861 and 1865. The government, the United States government, the Northern government paid good money for these Staten Island boats, anywhere between $70,000 and $90,000. Oh, they, they, they bought the, the Northfield and the Clifton and the Westfield and a boat called the Hunchback, and, and they all served gallantly in the war. Some of them were destroyed in battle. Uh, some of them were destroyed by the, the Northern Navy so that they couldn't be captured by the Confederacy. Um, most of the boats uh, did live on but because they were, um, and I wouldn't say they were rebuilt, but new ones were built to replace them and they were given the same name to honor these boats that were in the, the service of the United States Navy and the United States military. So you see in ferry boat history, you see again, there's another Westfield, there's another Northfield, another Clifton, another Southfield. So anyway, I just wanted to you know, let you know about that. Um, around 1886, there's a very important individual who comes to Staten Island, and his name is Erastus Wyman. He is actually a Canadian, and he's very interested in improving Staten Island. So he has a, a meeting with a man by the name of Robert Garrett, who runs the North Shore ferries from Staten Island. There were ferries that ran from New Brighton, from Sailor's Snug Harbor, from Port Richmond, from West Brighton, Mariners Harbor. There was all these different boats on the North Shore on the Kill Van Cull. There were also a series of, of ferry boats that ran from the East Shore, from Clifton, from Tompkinsville, from Stapleton. Well, Erastus Wyman had it in his head that he really wanted to consolidate ferry service on Staten Island. And he wanted to um, have a North Shore rail line. And he wanted the North Shore rail line to hook up with the already uh, established East Shore rail line. But there was a problem. The, the, the North Shore rail line stopped at New Brighton. The East Shore rail line stopped at Tompkinsville. So there's no connection there because the land there is owned by the federal government. It's owned by the Lighthouse Depot. It's all coming together, Lighthouse Museum, Lighthouse Depot. He petitions Congress to let a tunnel be built so that the two railroads can meet at this new location. And at this new location, he built a ferry terminal. And that ferry terminal would have a ferry run that we still use today. It is the St. George to Whitehall run that so many of you use or have used to get to your jobs or your recreation in Manhattan. It wasn't always called St. George. Here's the thing. Um, Erastus Wyman was, uh, he was using land that belonged to a man by the name of George Law. And he owed Law money. And he went to Law and he said, I don't have the money 
can I please be given a, a second chance to pay in a few months? And Law said, no, absolutely not. And then he, 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 he pressed on Erastus Wyman, like he always did. And he said, well, now, George, if you give me uh, a few more months to pay my loan to you, I will make your name live on for all time. I will canonize your name, and I will turn it into a village on Staten Island. So George Law is, is the man who St. George is named after, and it was named after him because Erastus Wyman owed him money. So that's where the name St. George comes from, and it's true. I swear it's true. Now, the, the miracle here, and it's not really a miracle, but the wonderful thing here is that, again, that is the only ferry run that we still have today, the one from St. George to Whitehall in Manhattan, was established by Erastus Wyman. Just a little, a little interesting side note here about Erastus Wyman. He got involved with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and they actually would run the North Shore Rail Line and that, that ferry run that went to Manhattan. They ran it till 1905. Well, Wyman needed to get people to buy tickets for the ferry boat and for the railroad because he had to get money to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. So he set up all these attractions on Staten Island. He built the most amazing stadium in St. George. And the New York Metropolitans, yes, the first New York Mets, played on Staten Island at this stadium for two seasons, 1886 and 1887. He established a bed and breakfast out in Eltingville, and he called it the Woods of Arden Inn. And yes, that is the same house that we call today the Olmsted Beale House. He wanted people to take the, the train out to Eltingville, stay at the Woods of Arden Inn, go fishing in the uh, Raritan Bay, go swimming, eat your fill of oysters and clams. He also built a place called Aristina on the border of, and I know some of you, you, you catch, you caught that it, it's named after Erastus Wyman, the, Erastus Wyman. The, the place called Aristina is the location where a Buffalo Bill's Wild West show performed for the masses on Staten Island. So Sitting Bull was there and, and Buffalo Bill was there, Annie Oakley, and they'd put on performances for the public. Uh, they'd reenact battles uh, that were fought out in the Western United States between the cavalry and the Native Americans. Or they would, you know, have all kinds of uh, shooting competitions and displays of shooting and you know, hold the rifle in the back and use a mirror and shoot the, the bottle off the fence. Oh, it was just crazy what, what was going on. But this was all for the railroads and for the ferries so that Wyman could get people to Staten Island to use these, these uh, modes of uh, transportation. Okay. Baltimore and Ohio Railroad takes over in the 1890s, pushes Wyman out because Wyman has become financially embarrassed. So that's a, the railroad on the North Shore and the ferry run is run by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. People are upset by the 1890s, the late 1890s, because the boats are filthy, the boats are old. They're still using the boats that were built at the end of the Civil War. Uh, they're dirty, uh, they're late, they're, you know, it was just terrible. The public was really upset, so they petitioned um, then borough president George Cromwell to petition the city of New York to take over ferry service. Now, the city of New York never operated a ferry in all the years that the city of New York was around. And it was after consolidation when Staten Island became part of the city that the people of Staten Island said, we need ferry service operated by the city of New York. And the city of New York simply said, no, we have no interest in getting in the ferry business for you people. But then, in, November, in, in 1901, on June 14th, there was a major accident. The Northfield ferry boat run by the Baltimore and Ohio was backing out of Whitehall to go on its ferry run to Staten Island when it was slammed from behind by a boat called the March Chunk. 
The March Chunk was actually a boat run by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad that was not supposed to be using the Whitehall uh, slip there. They were supposed to be upriver on the Hudson River using a slip up there. But because there were so many transportation opportunities at Whitehall, you know, we had horse-drawn carriages and cabs and things of that nature, it was easier for the March Chunk to pull in at Whitehall and better for its commuters. Well, the people of Staten Island were really mad when this happened. A few people lost their life on the Northfield from this accident. Many of the horses that were pulling carriages along actually fell into the water and were drowned. People were livid. And they finally, they, they petitioned and petitioned, and the city of New York finally agreed that they would operate ferry service for these people in Staten Island so that they could quiet, quiet the people of Staten Island down. They even ordered five new ferry boats, and these ferry boats would be called the borough class of boats. Four of them were made in Sparrows Point, uh, Maryland, at a shipyard down there because the shipyards on, in Staten Island could not, uh, could not accommodate uh, making five brand new ferry boats. But the fifth ferry boat was made on Staten Island. In fact, it was on October 25th, 1905, that municipal, New York City owned, Municipal ferry service began between Staten Island and Manhattan. One boat of the borough class took off from St. George at Staten Island. One boat took off from Whitehall in Manhattan. And fittingly, the one that took off from Manhattan was called the Manhattan. <laughs> the one that took off from Staten Island was called the Richmond. So they take off at the same time, they're coming across the harbor, and what happens when they get to the Statue of Liberty? No, they don't crash. But the three other ferry boats come out to meet them. All five come together. What are the th other three? What are they called? Queens, the Bronx, and the Brooklyn. That's why they're called the borough class of boats. They're launched in 1905. They're beautiful boats and they, they're, they're in service for many, many years. The next class of boats, because when boats are launched, they're generally in a class. You know, they have sister ships, so to speak. Well, <clears throat> the next class of boats wasn't a class at all. It was actually a bunch of single ferry boats that were uh, launched in about an eight year period, but they were called the single class of ferry boats. First one was the Mayor Gaynor, the next one was the President Roosevelt, and the next one was the first boat to be called the American Legion. The Mayor Gaynor was built in 1914. It actually crossed the harbor for 36 years. On November 5th, 1921, the President Roosevelt was launched. And of course, it's 1921, so we have to realize it's named after Theodore Roosevelt because Franklin would not be president for many years thereafter. Uh, the President Roosevelt was built at Staten Island Shipbuilding Company in Mariner's Harbor. The next class of boats that we see is the Dongan Hills class. The Dongan Hills boat itself was delivered for service in 1928. It held 26 cars and 2,250 passengers. Sister ship, the Tompkinsville, named after the community, was delivered during September 1930. And still its third sister ship, the Knickerbocker, was launched in October 1931. And as you all know, uh, the Knickerbocker is actually a name that was used um, by Washington Irving to describe original settlers of Manhattan. The next class we see after that is the Mary Murray class of Staten Island ferry boats. They too are all built on Staten Island. One boat bore the name Gold Star Mother, and it was named for mothers who had lost sons in World War I. Its sister ship was the Miss New York, yes, for the beauty pageant 
queen. Um, and the first boat was known as the Mary Murray. All three ships were built at United Shipyards in Mariner's Harbor. The first one uh, commissioned was the Mary Murray, and she was commissioned in 1937. Uh, you may recall driving down uh, the New Jersey Turnpike back in the 1990s and by exit nine, you would see a Staten Island ferry boat off in the Raritan River. Well, that was the Mary Murray that was sitting there for years and years and years and years. A man by the name of George Searle had actually uh, bought the ferry boat after it was decommissioned and he put it there so that he could make it into a restaurant. Unfortunately, the New Jersey County that was responsible for where it sat refused to build a road from the highway to the Mary Murray ship so people could get to it for the restaurant. So George was just stuck with this boat out in the Raritan River. But that was the Mary Murray. The Mary Murray was named after a woman who is credited with helping us win the Revolutionary War. She lived in Murray Hill, Manhattan, and after the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, as uh, the, 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 the uh, American army was, was, was escaping, they had lost the battle, so they were hightailing it out of Brooklyn going through Manhattan. As they were trying to escape, Mary Murray invited the British officers in to her house, and she would uh, give them, you know, she gave them tea and crumpets or whatever it is you know, they served at that time. And her maid was up in the upper floor of her house watching as, as the Americans were getting away. And she kept the, the British officers busy until the American army was able to flee. And that was a real turning point in the war, believe it or not. The Mary Murray was also one of the only Staten Island ferries to have a big painting of, of Mary Murray in, in the boat itself. And that, ferry, that painting went missing for many years. And when I was working for the Staten Island Museum, we actually were in a storage facility owned by the, you know, the uh, DOT. And I just happened to spot the painting over on the, buried over amongst some, some stuff over on the side there. I was like, that's the Mary Murray painting that went missing. Anyway, I, I'm off track as usual. But um, interesting to note too, that the Miss New York, believe it or not, was the first Staten Island Ferry to actually have a snack bar on it. It opened on June 30th, 1950. The riding public could get their fill of ice cream, pastry, coffee, sandwiches. They had two kinds of soft drinks. So it was, it was a very popular boat, I should, I should add. The Merrill class of ferry boats, that was the next class of ferry boats to be uh, commissioned and put in the water. Uh, Private first class Joseph F. Merrill was a uh, Medal of Honor winner. He was killed in, uh, during World War II near Low Germany. He was credited with saving his battalion from um, a sure massacre. He took on the Germans pretty much single-handedly during a battle and um, he died while he was, um, you know, doing his, his, his thing. And so he was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously at a ceremony at Fort Wadsworth that was given to his sister. But this whole class of ferry boats and a ferry boat was named in his honor. The sister ships to the Merrill boat were the Verrazano, two Zs, not one Z, um, and the Cornelius G. Kalf. Kalf was a real estate um, entrepreneur going back to the early 1900s. And he was not only very involved with real estate, he was very involved with cultural organizations. In fact, he was uh, worked with the Daughters of the American Revolution to save Conference House Park. He was very involved with the Staten Island Institute of Arts and Sciences, now the Staten Island Museum. So those three ships were all built at the Bethlehem Shipyard. The Merrill was christened August 19th, 1950. The Verrazano was uh, christened on January 9th, 1951. The Cornelius Kalf was actually launched on October 16th, 1950. 
The next class of boats that we see is not built on Staten Island. By the early 60s, many of the shipbuilding companies are gone from Staten Island or they can't handle building a newer, bigger class of boats. So we see that the Kennedy class of boats is built at a place called Orange, Texas. And um, the Kennedy would actually arrive on Staten Island in May 1965. It cost $4.5 million. Its sister ship, another American legion, um, was also launched at this time. The third ship in that class was actually the Herbert Lehman of Lehman Brothers, the financial corporation. Now, when the Lehman was put out of commission and the American Legion was put out of commission, they weren't just sold, you know, uh, just for their scrap metal. They were actually viewed as being ripe with parts for the John F. Kennedy because the Kennedy was not going to be going out of service anytime soon. And so the, the parts were removed from those two boats and put in the, in the storage shops of the Staten Island Ferry in order to keep the Kennedy going for many, many years. Um, the next class of boats that we see is the Barbary class of boats. And they go into service during late 1981. At first they wanted to call the Andrew J. Barbary the Aldo Moro for a former prime minister of Italy who was kidnapped and slain in 1978. But people thought more about it and they decided to name it after a beloved high school football coach. Andrew J. Barberi, who, uh, uh, who worked at Curtis High School. The sister ship of the Barberi is, of course, the Samuel I. Newhouse. And, of course, it's named after the man who bought the Staten Island Advance in 1922, and who went on to develop Advance uh, Publications, a company that owned uh, dozens of, more than dozens of newspapers own television stations, cable television stations, magazines, Condé Nast, uh, the list goes on and on and on. The next class of boats is the Alice Austin and the John A. Noble. They are launched in 1986. And of course, we're, we're in the facility uh, that is named after the artist John Noble. And over my shoulder, you can see a life preserver from the Noble ferry boat. Um, they were, are the smallest boats in service, uh, 207 feet long. They were mainly used on nights and weekends when there wasn't uh, so many people riding ferries. Now, the Barbary class was always looked upon as the workhorses of the Staten Island Ferry crew, and they could accommodate about 6,000 people. Now, of course, they couldn't accommodate automobiles. Um, the Kennedy was the last boat that would accommodate automobiles. And then, of course, after 9-11, we stopped putting automobiles on Staten Island ferry boats. The next class of boats, the Molinari class of boats. It was designed to incorporate the best of the Kennedy class of boats and the modernness of the Barbary class of boats. Um, those boats, the Molinari, uh, the Marquis, and the Spirit of America, um, had elevators, they had air, condi have air conditioning, they had display portals that showcased the harbor floor. The Guy V. Molinari was introduced to the writing public on January 26, 2005, and it was the first ferry to be named for a living person. The John J. Markey uh, began running from Manhattan to Staten Island on May 20th, 2005. Um, of course, we all remember John J. Markey. He was the longest serving politician probably in the history of the United States. He served for 50 years. Um, the Spirit of America was set sail on April 4th, 2006. There was a lot of controversy about that name. They wanted to call it the September 11th, but people felt that it was too, too much of a reminder of that, that awful day that we experienced. So everybody settled for the Spirit of America. Um, Technically, there are two more class, uh, two more ferry boats 
in uh, the, the Staten Island ferry boat system. One is not a ferry boat at all. It is actually the third American legion, and it is uh, you know maintained by the Staten Island ferry system. This boat was bought in the aftermath of 9-11. It's a utility boat, and it is, uh, was built to, to go where there's emergencies in the New York Harbor, to assist with emergencies um, anywhere you know, where it might be needed. And again, it's the third American Legion in the system. Um, the other boat is called the Michael Cosgrove. And the Michael Cosgrove um, has a, a sad and dubious distinction of carrying the unknown dead out to Potter's Field on Hart Island, uh, usually once a week. It goes to the various boroughs, picks up um, those bodies, and takes them out for a proper burial at uh, Hart Island. In the old days, I know it was the, the, the prisoners at Rikers Island who would do, you know, you know, inter the bodies and dig the graves and everything. There was some good um, that would happen afterwards. Every once in a while, somebody would uh, discover that their relative was buried out on Hearts Island in the Potter's Field, and they would um, be able to get the, the person back and give them a, a, a burial in their uh, family plot or wherever. Well, we are entering a whole new class of Staten Island ferries. We have the Alice class of a Staten Island ferry boats. They've been slowed down because of uh, the COVID and the, because where they're being built, um, Eastern Shipbuilding Group in Florida was hit by a couple of hurricanes. So they were supposed to be, uh, one of them was supposed to already be launched and another one was supposed to be in the process, but this has been pushed back. The first boat of the Alice class is the Staff Sergeant Michael J. Alice, and, and that is named after a soldier who was killed in Afghanistan. The second boat has been named the Sandy Ground after the community of um, free African Americans that has been in existence since the early 1800s. So um, both of those boats are expected hopefully within the next two years. The third boat, as of now, has not been named. Now to close out, I will say a little bit about Staten Island Ferry Fairs, because I mean, the Staten Island Ferry was the world famous nickel ride that you couldn't beat. You know, you got the, the New York skyline, you could see the Statue of Liberty, you could see Governor's Island. You know, it was very exciting. It was only a nickel, see the world for a nickel. Well, they started charging the nickel in 1905 when the city took over service. And they didn't, they charged that nickel up until 1972. And then it went to 10 cents. In 1975, it went to 25 cents. Um, then about 1990, it went to 50 cents. And then in 1997, uh, the Staten Island v uh, Ferry became part of a, a program of New York, in New York City where you only paid one fare. So in other words, you would pay maybe the one fare on the bus to get to the Staten Island Ferry and you already paid your fare. So the Staten Island Ferry boat became free in 1997. So uh, we will end on that happy note, but I do want to uh, acknowledge a few things. Here we have a wonderful uh, artifact. It's called a mast headlight. It is from the Noble Maritime Collections collection. And um, it, we have it here on display. It's believed to have been at the head of one of the Staten Island ferries in the, in the mid 20th century. We also have another life preserver, excuse me, <laughs> from the John F. Kennedy ferry boat, which very soon, if not already, has already gone out of service. And one other thing to note is I have written a book called The Staten Island Ferry, A History, and it was published by the Staten Island Museum in 2008. And um, you can always uh, purchase it from me or from the Staten Island Museum. I would like to invite you all to go to the website noblemaritime.org slash now to see all the wonderful videos that have been put together by the Noble Maritime Collection. We'll see you there. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.